So good morning. Good morning from Germany. From uh, I'm I'm locating right right now in Germany for a visit. Uh, we are very glad uh, that once again you are with us in the in this Sai Cafe talk that is organized by the, the International Relations Office of the Hellenic Mediterranean University and the European University Athena. It's a great pleasure that we have a professor. Um, Dimitris Calderis. Dimitris Calderis is an associate professor in the Department of Electronic Engineering. He, ha he has received his bachelor degree from the University of Leeds in 1997 in chemistry and then a PhD from the same university in 2001. His research interests include biochar, hydrochar, hydrothermal carbonization, agriculture, uh, harvesting of um, uh, materials. Uh, his work has received more than 4,500 citations. His age index is 29. Recently, he has been among the top uh, most distinguished scientists within the Hellenic Mediterranean University. So it um, is a pleasure. He's a colleague of us. So it's a double pleasure to have and welcome uh, Dimitris Calderis uh, in our Sci Cafe talks. So the floor is yours, Dimitris, in order to travel us through this fascinating world of the hydro, how do you call it, hydro charge <laughs> or biochar. Thank you very of, much of, for of, the of acceptance my, yes, and also for the Thank you, Costas, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Kavulakis and you for giving me this opportunity to participate in uh, the Science Cafe Talks. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, I hope you can see it now. Uh, yes, Dimitris, if you, if you also make it full uh, screen, it will be even better. Just give me one minute. Okay. Um, I have made it full screen now. Can you see it as full screen? Not yet, but it will happen. I can see that it will happen eventually. Yes. It's full screen for me now. Uh, I don't know. Do you use uh, two screens? Are you using two screens? Probably you. No, are no, no, no. Just, 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 just. Okay, one. let it time. It will happen. It will happen. It has not been appeared okay. as a full screen until now, but it will happen. Let's start. Okay. Okay. So um, I know that the audience has uh, like there are several different backgrounds in the audience. So I'll try to be as simple as possible in this presentation, uh, focusing on uh, the basics of. Uh, hydrothermal carbonization. I mean, this presentation uh, it consists of three parts. The first one is about the fundamentals of subcritical water because water is the basis, is the medium that we use for hydrothermal carbonization. So we need to know the, the basics. Um, then we will move on to uh, the hydrothermal carbonization itself and uh, talk a little bit about the conditions experimental conditions and the biomass, the biomasses we use. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about some recent results we have uh, uh, in this field. So the first part, uh, we'll talk about uh, water. Well, water is a very unique molecule. This is what I like to stress out. Water at the ambient conditions, normal conditions, um, forms irregular clusters of three or four water molecules. They are connected together by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds dominate the water chemistry and make water a very unusual molecule. It may be usual in terms of structure, only one uh, oxygen atom connected to two hydrogen atoms, but because uh, the water molecules are connected between them with hydrogen bonds, all the properties of water change. They are very abnormal. Excuse me, Dimitris. Uh, uh, yes. We only see the first uh, screen, the first uh, page. Now, can you see the second, the figure no. one? No, 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 no. Only the first. And yeah. it, and it still is not a full screen. Stop, yeah. stop sharing and share again. Dimitris probably is, has been blocked. Okay. Stop share. Share. Share again. Now it's full screen. Okay. Now, okay. I use a different different sharing option. Yes. Okay. 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 Let me go a little bit upwards. Sorry. 
Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is this is uh, how the water uh, looks uh, when it's uh, at ambient conditions uh, in normal temperature and pressure. So it's not free water molecules in a glass of water. Water molecules are connected between them through these bonds uh, shown here with uh, green uh, dot lines, uh, which are called hydrogen bonds. Okay, so we said that these hydrogen bonds make water very very unique. Uh, for example, these are, let me move, okay. Uh, these are some properties affected by the hydrogen bonding in water. For example, the dielectric constant, which is a measure of the polarity of water, is very high in water, very high in other hydrogen bonded liquids, such as hydrogen cyanide and informamide. But in non-hydrogen bonded liquids, uh, the dielectric constant is, is much, much lower. The same applies to viscosity and many other properties of water. So in this sense, water is, is quite abnormal in its behavior. So why, why do we pay attention, especially to the dielectric constant of water and why did I mention it? Because it is direct, directly affects the polarity of water. Uh, from the 80s, uh, we were looking uh, to develop a solvent um, a green solvent uh, to avoid the typical organic solvents in chemistry in order to solubilize polar substances and non-polar substances. Water at normal conditions is a very good solvent for polar substances. Uh, this means that it can interact very well with only polar substances. But if we can change the dielectric constant of water this means that we can change its polarity and make water a non-polar solvent, which practically means that it can interact with non-polar substances. Why do we need to do this? Because many contaminants, many hazardous contaminants in soil, in water, and elsewhere are non-polar. So we cannot treat them otherwise. And also, for example, many organic chemicals found in plants and in other matrices, um, are non-polar. So the only way for water to interact with these non-polar substances is to make it a non-polar solvent. So how do we do this? By increasing the temperature of water in a closed reactor, because if we increase the temperature in an open beaker, for example, it will evaporate, so it's not good for us. So uh, what we do is we use a closed reactor. We will soon uh, see pictures of it. Uh, and we heat the water mostly in this range of temperatures between 100 degrees Celsius and 374. And we create what we call subcritical water. This is our medium. We call it subcritical water. It is hot water under pressure. So it's still liquid, but not like normal water. It's like a thin liquid or a dense, very dense gas, if we like, if we like to depict it in our minds. At these conditions, at these temperatures, and of course under enough pressure, the hydrogen bonding that water has is destroyed. So the dielectric constant is very much reduced, and so is the polarity. The polarity is reduced. In, at these conditions, water is not, uh, does not belong, its, it's water molecule does not belong in groups of four or five uh, water uh, uh, molecules, but it's in most cases alone, sing, single water molecules. Um, what is good about this is by varying the temperature within the reactor, always within this range between 100 degrees Celsius and 374 degrees Celsius, we can tune the properties of water, which practically means we can modify it to interact with specific molecules in the way we want. Uh, just a note here that uh, we don't usually use water above the critical point because it's very corrosive. The equipment that we need uh, to work with supercritical water is much more expensive because it has to be from titanium because only titanium can withstand uh, these pressures and the corrosive properties of water. So we keep water 
well below this temperature. And as we will see next, in most cases, we work below 300 degrees Celsius. This is a phase diagram of water, which summarizes what we have just said. So the, the area uh, we would like to work in is the subcritical water area shown here in blue. Okay, so we try to avoid the supercritical water area. This is a photo we took uh, back in my PhD years using a diamond anvil cell. This is what happens when you heat water under pressure in a closed reactor. The first uh, picture on the left is normal water at ambient conditions. And then as we raise the temperature, water has of course some headspace above it and it starts to evaporate. But the third picture on the right is what we call subcritical water. It's like a unified phase that you can think of it as a very dense gas or a very, very thin liquid. But I think dense gas is, 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 more, is a better uh, representation. Uh, these are the reactors we use, the laboratory scale reactors, of course. Uh, usually they are cylinders made from stainless steel and very, very simple equipment. Uh, uh, is that you can heat easily in a normal uh, laboratory oven at the required temperature. Uh, of course, the, these reactors come uh, in different uh, capacities. This is a very small reactor with a capacity of 30 ml. Uh, in, in the laboratory, we have a bigger one uh, with a capacity of 250 ml. Um, this is a pilot scale uh, reactor that we built uh, during my postdoc years in the United States. The, the capacity of this reactor is uh, about 10 liters. This is a pilot scale unit I did my PhD on, which is exactly the same as the laboratory reactor. It has basically no difference uh, on it. It's uh, made from stainless steel uh, with two cups, exit, and uh, and, and of course, we can operate this in static mode. I will explain in a moment what static mode is. It's a no-flow no uh, mode. Uh, this is a different uh, kind of setup. This is a pilot scale a dynamic mode uh, uh, subcritical water reactor. Again, the water, the pressurized water, uh, goes in the, the cylinder in the middle. But because extraction or the use of subcritical water is dynamic, which means that there is flow, uh, the equipment is much more uh, complex and, and much more uh, expensive. So generally, we prefer to work in a static mode, no flow. The results are basically the same, but the equipment is a lot simpler and a lot, a lot more cost efficient. So what, which were the first applications of subcritical water back in the 80s, at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s? The first very important application was the subcritical water extraction of biologically important molecules from plants. Because until then, what, when we wanted to extract uh, medicinal uh, molecules from plants to prepare new drugs for the pharmaceutical industries, uh, the industry usually used uh, sol solvents, organic solvents, such as hexane uh, and other uh, acetone and so on. But uh, there were a lot of residues, toxic residues from these solvents. So we tried to extract these biologically important molecules using subcritical water. Uh, it worked very well. Uh, still until now, uh, there are a lot of um, biologically important molecules, such as, uh, for example, uh, fragrance uh, for, the, uh, for, for various industries extracted using subcritical water. Uh, the problem, of course, is that because we need to elevate the temperature uh, in subcritical water extraction, we have to make sure beforehand that the molecules that we want to extract uh, are uh, heat resistant, so they are not degraded in uh, at higher temperatures above uh, 200 or 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, as we saw the reactors earlier, there are two modes of operation in sub when we use subcritical water. The same applies uh, in hydrothermal carbonization. The static mode is when we just pressurize 
everything inside the reactor. Uh, we put the reactor inside the oven, and then after a certain time, we take the reactor out and we cool it and we take the contents. And we analyze or we move to the next phase uh, of, uh, of working with the sample. The dynamic mode um, is, uh, as I said, a more complex mode. And there is a flow of water. Okay, uh, the, the advantage of the dynamic mode is that uh, we can take fractions, different fractions with time, and we can analyze, for example, the progress of a reaction. Uh, as, okay, we discussed about the thermally stable molecules. In, in every case, this, the molecule should be thermally stable. The second application that was developed back in the 90s was the subcritical water chromatography, exactly for the same reason that uh, we, we prepare some critical water extraction to avoid using excessive amounts of organic solvents. So subcritical water chromatography makes use of subcritical water or modified subcritical water. So we can modify the polarity of water, as we said, to separate different molecules in chromatographic separations. I'll just show you an example, uh, before that example, uh, when we do uh, subcritical water chromatography, the advantage is that we can almost completely remove hazardous organic solvents um, from the system, from our analysis. Um, again, the analytes that we separate should not get degraded or oxidized during analysis, which is always a risk. And the stationary phase is that um, we use in the columns, uh, they have to be very specific to avoid the stripping, to avoid uh, them being uh, destroyed. This is an example, a simple chromatogram of some of a separation uh, of some caffeine derivatives. Uh, you can see that in the in the figure A above, uh, there is a lot of tailing. This is a bad quality chromatogram when we used 60% uh, water and 40% methanol for the separation as solvent. But in the chromatogram at the bottom, when we used only water at elevated temperature, subcritical water uh, separation, we achieved a much better separation. Subcritical water chromatography has not, is not really used widely. Uh, it has very, very specific applications. Now, the third application, uh, again, again, back in the 90s, was the degradation of contaminants in soil and wastewater. And exactly this was the topic I did my PhD on. We oxidized the explosives that were found in soil. Uh, very useful technique, very quick technique, very efficient technique that you can oxidize and completely destroy uh, pesticides, explosives, hydrocarbons, and other contaminants found in soil in very short times, less than two hours, or, or in some cases, even less than an hour, at temperatures up to 250 degrees Celsius. Um, there are, of course, disadvantages. For example, when you oxidize uh, an organic molecule, uh, maybe the, um, uh, the next molecules you produce the byproducts may be more toxic than the original ones, which is always a risk. But in our case, that didn't happen. Um, and large scale applications are limited because uh, when you have, for example, several, several tons of uh, contaminated soil to, to clean up, uh, it's not easy to uh, excavate and transfer these tons of soil to a very large reactor and pressurize it with water and so on. So there are technical limitations in this application. Uh, and also there are some cost uh, limitations. But generally, it has worked very well up to the pilot scale uh, level. This is, uh, I won't go into details uh, about this figure. It just shows you. Uh, uh, as a summary, the mechanism of extraction and degradation, how, how subcritical water uh, interacts, for example, with a soil molecule. First of all, it goes inside the soil particle, the soil particle, it solubilizes the contaminants and it destroys them as soon as they enter the water phase. This is a sequence. So first, 
we have extraction of the contaminant or extraction of the biologically active molecule from the plant uh, particle, then the water transfers the molecule into the water phase. And if we talk about contaminants, it destroys them. Or if we talk about the biologically active uh, molecules, it carries them on to a different uh, phase. These are some uh, uh, references for further reading, including some of my own back in 2000 with a group in the United States. So now uh, let's move on to the hydrothermal carbonization of biomass, a more modern topic, which came later uh, than the subcritical water extraction. Um, what is hydrothermal carbonization? A simple definition is a thermochemical conversion technology for wet biomasses. And when I say wet biomasses, I don't mean with a very high moisture, even 30 or 40% moisture in a biomass is enough. Uh, there are usually three different kinds of products that we get from hydrothermal carbonization, high carbon solid materials that we, that we will focus on from now on, the hydrochars. Uh, of course, we use water in this process. So there is always a waste water coming out from the process, the aqueous phase, which it has some uses, but we will not focus on this in this presentation. And there is a small part of gas, which may be uh, which a result of the breakdown of biomass. It may be carbon dioxide mainly, or ammonia, or hydrogen, and similar uh, low molecular weight uh, gases. The first papers were published back in 2000, so it's a relatively new application for biomasses. At this point, I would like to clarify that hydrothermal carbonization focuses on the solid product, on the hydrochar. It's not the same as hydrothermal gasification, which focuses on the, um, on the gases to produce more gases. Uh, and it's not the same as hydrothermal liquefaction, uh, which is e equally important in terms of industrial applications as hydrothermal carbonization, but focuses on the wastewater, on the chemicals present in the wastewater uh, of the process. On the right, on the left image is the hydrochar, the solid product we usually get from the from hydrothermal carbonization. If you in, more, in most from most biomasses, uh, it has this brown appearance. I have put uh, another carbon product on the right, which is biochar. Of course, carbonization, the process of carbonization is more complete uh, on biochar, hence the more dark color. Carbonization is not complete in during hydrothermal carbonization, hence the brown color. Okay, what is the focus of hydrothermal carbonization? I mean, why do we do all this? Why we spend our time developing this process? Because HTC is part of circular bioeconomy. Our first focus, our first objective is to find a sustainable biomass utilization option. Because there are several biomasses that are not currently being exploited, are not currently being used, and they're thrown uh, away in landfills, are disposed of in landfills, or they're burned out in the open. So in order to uh, utilize these biomasses and prepare some new products, we work with uh, HTC. So HTC in summary is a biomass conversion technology to added value materials. What, what kind of biomasses can we use in HTC? There are dozens of biomasses that we use. As we said, of course, because we need the water HTC is based on subcritical water. So uh, preferably uh, wet agricultural residues, grass, plant residues, or residues from uh, industrial fruit processing, for example, uh, apple peels or um, orange peels that have a high moisture content. These are the most used. 
Sewage sludge is a very problematic uh, waste uh, for the industry. There are not many uses, not many options to manage sustainably sewage sludge. So uh, recently we have started working with sewage sludge because it contains a, a high percentage of nitrogen and phosphorus compound. We will see what is the use of this of the sludge next. Food waste is always a problem. In, in the European Union last year, there were millions of tons of food waste uh, that were not consumed by people. So food waste is always a good candidate for this uh, process. And algae, algae is now emerging. Uh, there are several countries in the world, especially in the United States, millions of tons of algae end up in uh, American shores. So algae also uh, contains some important uh, molecules, biologically important molecules, high phosphorus or high nitrogen content that can be maintained through this process, that can be extracted through uh, this process. Uh, of course, we can use dry biomasses, okay? Dry biomasses are not out of the question, but if you use a biomass that is completely dry, for example, wood clippings, wood prunings, you have to add extra water. So you need a source of water, which increases the cost. Um, and you have to make sure beforehand that your water mixes very well with your dry biomass. Okay, so you cannot rely that subcritical water will get mixed with your bioma biomass after they enter the reactor. You have to mix them well beforehand. So these, these two uh, parameters increase the cost and the uh, experimental complexity. This is why we prefer wet uh, biomasses. Uh, what determines the properties of the different uh, of the, three kind of, of the three products of HTC. Of course, the type of biomass plays a very important role, what kind of biomass it is. The temperature is the second most important parameter in the process. The time plays also an important role. The pH of water, the pressure inside the reactor play, does not play an important role, provided there is enough pressure to maintain the liquid state. Uh, the size of biomass particles does not play a major role, but they have to be small particles so that water can penetrate easily and can interact easily with the biomass. And also, uh, we usually grind the biomass beforehand uh, in order to prepare a uniform biomass, because originally the biomass may not be uniform. So when we grind it and mix it with itself, we uh, make it, we homogenize it. Okay, so about the effect of biomass type, uh, agricultural biomasses um, usually uh, have a lignin cellulose and hemicellulose. So the different uh, percentage of each of this uh, content uh, determines what products we will get at the end. Lignin uh, is the most difficult, the hardest to decompose during hydrothermal carbonization, it requires higher temperatures. So in, generally speaking, when we use low temperature HTC, we expect lignin to maintain its structure and not get degraded. Cellulose and hemicellulose uh, degrade uh, and are converted much more easily than lignin. So the relative content, the relative percentage of each of these components uh, greatly affects uh, hydrothermal carbonization products. This is like a, a, a brief diagram of um, the pathway for each component. This is a very basic uh, diagram, but in, in all cases for lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose, hydrolysis is the first step. Uh, fragmentation occurs, dehydration, polymerization at the end until we get the final hydrochar product, the solid product. So this is a very general diagram. Of course, the processes are much more complex because lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose are very complex, very complex uh, carbohydrates. So there are several different reactions happening, but this is a basic diagram. 
Here I give you a table as an example uh, of uh, the different uh, biomasses that we can use. You can see that each of these biomass has very different cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin content. So you can imagine with your mind how many different biochars, I'm sorry, hydrochars we can obtain if we use different biomass, different temperature, different residence time, uh, different pH of water, and so on. Practically, there are hundreds of different hydrochars that can produce all with different properties. The viscosity of water uh, increases, no, uh, excuse me, is, is reduced as we increase the temperature. So this allows better penetration into the porous media. Viscosity is the resistance of the resistance to flow. So the higher the temperature, the less the resistance to flow. So now water can penetrate very, very easily in porous media such as soil and biomass and so on. All the reactions greatly depend on temperatures kinetically. Uh, but because of the complexity of the biomass structure, there is still a lot of work to be done to study the effect of temperature in each of these process. I mean, in lignin degradation, cellulose degradation, and hemicellulose degradation. In any case, temperature is considered the single most important parameter in HTC. Uh, at higher temperatures, we get lower hydrochar yield, uh, we get more uh, wastewater and gases, but for the solid, for the hydrochar, we have a higher carbon content at higher temperature, which is beneficial, for example, if hydrochar is addressed uh, to become a solid fuel in this application. At lower temperatures, uh, the hydrochar yield is higher because lignin has not been decomposed, uh, but we receive less amount of water and fewer gases. Also, carbonization is not complete at lower temperatures. So the carbon content for hydrogen is lower. Time, now time has a similar effect uh, in the process as temperature, but not so intense, not so intense. And uh, practically most groups have determined that it may not be good to use long, very long uh, HTC times above six hours because uh, surface functional groups are completely removed from the solid, from the hydrogen, and the surface is, is practically very inert. Uh, so in most cases, we use residence times between one and six hours. Sorry. Yeah. About the pH, uh, the pH is one parameter that it's not very well studied. Uh, because usually we use uh, the natural water that exists uh, within the biomass. We don't add extra water, but uh, there are some preliminary results uh, when we add the different uh, pH water inside the reactor. Of course, we change the course of the reactions because now we can talk about acid catalysis of HTC or base catalysis of HTC. So many reactions inside the, the reactor chains. Uh, for example, lignin the, the, the composition is different. Uh, phenol production uh, is promoted when we use a base. Uh, when we use an acid, uh, we get more solid hydrochar. So depending on what we want to do beforehand, if we, if we know what, where we want to focus, we can use acid or base in our uh, reactions. This is the reverse engineering approach that I just uh, introduced. So if we, when we uh, decide how to set up a, a, an experiment, uh, we know in our mind what we want to achieve, what, what kind of hydrochar we want, for what kind of application we want this hydrochar. So we move back, backwards this is a bottoms up approach and uh, we select the appropriate biomass. For example, we may want to select a high lignin biomass if we want a high hydrochar um, yield. 
Uh, and of course, we choose beforehand the conditions of hydrothermal carbonization, uh, temperature and time. This is how we use it now. Instead of working just by adding the biomass in the reactor and getting any uh, product, uh, any random product. Uh, a little bit of, uh, about suet sludge. Uh, sludge is a very, very difficult uh, solid waste to be treated or to develop um, uh, an option, a sustainable option for valorization. Uh, usually it ends up in landfills, uh, which is not a sustainable uh, option. In some cases, uh, suet sludge ends up uh, in uh, filling cavities after extraction of metals, for example. Uh, but generally, this is a waste that is uh, produced every day from wastewater treatment plants. Um, it has some problems. For example, it has pathogens. It has microorganisms. It has some persistent organic chemicals that uh, should not be carried uh, into the hydrochar that is produced from it. But on the other hand, it has some uh, benefits that it has a non-toxic inorganic fraction. It has some nutrients uh, that can be potentially applied to plants, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So suet sludge is not easy to work with, but because of these non-toxic inorganic fractions, we, we, we have made some trials with uh, hydrothermally carbonizing. The reactions for suet sludge are different, not exactly the same as other agricultural residues because uh, sludge has very low lignin, it has proteins inside and, and different composition. Uh, but again, hydrolysis is always the first step. We aim to uh, recover nitrogen rich compounds from hydrogen from uh, from uh, from the from the suet sludge and also recover phosphorus sometimes uh, sludge has a high ash content which is not good because if we uh, want to use the hydrochar from sludge as a fuel we need as low ash content as possible so uh, that generally hydrochar from sludge is not used as fuel now, the latest uh, trend in hydrothermal carbonization is the use of marine algae. Algae contain a lot of lipids and proteins and high mineral, it has a high ash content. Again, algae are not suitable to become hydrochars uh, that, that uh, are going to be used as fuels. So we're talking at different applications here. Again, we focus on the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, compounds in algae to recover this. The not many, not many industrial scale applications for this for algae in terms of uh, hydrothermal carbonization. So, uh, in terms of characteriz characterization, what we usually perform is that, uh, of course, we measure the yield of the solid product compared to the original biomass. We measure the pH of the wastewater of uh, HTC. In 95% uh, of cases, if we don't use a catalyst beforehand, uh, acid or a base, um, the pH is uh, in the range of uh, three and four, so it's quite acidic. We use the electrical conductivity, which is a very important parameter. If we want to apply the hydrochars in soil, we want low electrical conductivity. We measure the ash content because as, as we said, is a crucial parameter if we want to use the hydrochar uh, as a solid fuel. Of course, elemental analysis is important to know the carbon content. And in some cases, if we want to apply the hydrochar in, um, for example, as an adsorbent of contaminants, we perform FTAR spectroscopy to analyze the surface functional groups, to see the uh, surface functional groups of the solid product. Uh, there are some techno-economic aspects. There are some problems mainly I would like to discuss about when we scale up this technology. Uh, most of the published papers are of laboratory scale or pilot uh, scale level. 
uh, when we talk about scaling up, things are not easy uh, because there are several problems involved. We need to perform mass and energy balance, of course, modeling, a detailed reactor design. And of course, the most important problem is the cost estimation because we should not forget that we work at slightly higher temperatures than normal. So this means there is an energy consumption to maintain this temperature. Uh, if, we want to, if we want to work at a dynamic mode, this means we have to uh, de determine the flow of wet biomass. And this is always a problem because each biomass has a different pumpability, different flow properties. Uh, there is maybe a safety uh, precaution here that uh, uh, at large scale, you have like a stainless steel reactor uh, pressurized. Usually pressures inside the reactor are in the range of 10 or 15 atmospheres or maybe 20 atmospheres. Uh, and there is a high capital investment. I mean, the initial investment for materials because there is a stainless steel involved to maintain, to withstand these temperatures and pressures is quite high compared to other technologies. I'll give you some examples of companies, European companies that work with hydrochars at the industrial level. One of them is in Germany, it's called the Sun Coal. They have a large pilot scale plant producing several tons per day of hydrochar. Uh, they go up to temperatures of 260 degrees Celsius, uh, which is capable of achieving enough carbonization of most biomasses. Uh, they have a membrane filter press to dewater uh, the wet hydrochar when it comes out from the reactor. Um, generally, this is the product they get. And uh, they use it as fuel. I think if I remember well, Sankoal uses this as biofuel, as a solid biofuel. This is their plant, their pilot scale plant. You can see at the bottom of it, the HTC reactor is this huge cylinder, which is at the bottom of the, of the picture. Here you can see it better. There are two cylinders. One is to heat water and pressurize it, and the other is where the biomass is. And then the hot pressurized water moves to the biomass uh, reactor, and uh, the interaction happens there. The conversion happens there. It basically, it's exactly the same concept as having a small laboratory reactor. Ava Biochem is located in Switzerland and their focus is slightly different. They don't focus on the solid uh, hydrochar product. They focus on 5-hydroxymethyl furfural. Uh, in most cases, during HTC, uh, furfurals are produced. Some of them are used as building blocks in the organic chemistry industry to produce other chemicals. 5-HMF uh, has a good price in the European market. Uh, so this industry focuses on producing this chemical, the, only this chemical, only this building block from various biomasses through HTC. Uh, uh, yes, one of the uses of 5HMF is, is in the resin manufacturing industry. This is the uh, pilot scale reactor uh, AVA has. Again, similar setup, two cylinders, one to pressurize the water and heat and pressurize the water, and the other one is the, for the biomass. A third company is called Peranova, located also in Germany. They focus on sewer sludge, mainly to divert sludge from uh, ending up in, uh, in landfills, uh, and they recover phosphorus. And then I think they uh, isolate phosphorus from the hydrochar of uh, sludge and they promote it to the agricultural industry and then they, they use it in, uh, to prepare granular phosphate fertilizers. Uh, this is quite good because HTC achieves 
two purposes here. You get an added value product, you get this phosphorus rich product, which is a hydrochar, but at the same time, you uh, divert sludge from ending up in, uh, in a landfill. Plant of uh, this company. Again, you can see at the back the two reactors, the two large cylinders. Now, let's move on to the third part of the presentation and we'll talk about the recent results in hydrothermal carbonization. So there are four main applications of the hydrochar, of the solid product. The first one is as an alternative solid fuel. The second one is a soil amendment. The third one is as an adsorbent of contaminants in soil or wastewaters. And the final application is as a solid support, as a carbon support for catalysts. Let's start with some recent results uh, in the first applications as a solid fuel. Uh, several researchers have achieved good higher heating values, uh, similar to lignite, in the range of 15 to 25 megajoules per kilogram. And also hydrochars have a very good pelletization behavior, which of course, it's a useful technique to make hydrochar more, more dense okay, to increase its uh, fuel behavior. And it also can be used with other fuels. It can be mixed with other pelletized fuel, fuels or with other, it can be pelletized with other biomasses. For example, you can have wood and hydrochars and pelletize them together. This is how the hydrochar pellets look like. The first one on the left uh, were prepared at a lower temperature of 180 degrees Celsius, uh, and then went into the pellet machine. Uh, the other ones on the uh, right were prepared at higher temperatures. That's why the, you, you can see that carbonization is more complete at the higher temperature. Um, but both had a very good uh, fuel behavior. Another study is the, and also quite a recent trend, is the co-hydrothermal carbonization of two different waste biomasses. One is swine manure, uh, and the other is cellulose. So here, the others used uh, manure from pigs and cellulose as a, a target molecule. Why did they do that? Because uh, swine manure has a high ash content, which we don't want uh, in, in fuels, in biofuels, but cellulose produced hydrochar with very, very low, almost zero ash content. So their target was to produce, to combine these two biomasses, these two materials, uh, produce a hydrochar with a low enough as content to, uh, to be used uh, as, as a fuel. And they achieved this by com combining shrine manure, one part, and cellulose, three parts. The second application is hydrochar as a soil amendment. Uh, many hydrochars, as we said, they contain important quantities of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So we have to find a way to incorporate this into some soil applications. There are two problems, very important problems. Uh, the pH of the hydrogen and the waste waters, but also of the solid product are acidic. So this may not be good when we apply the solid products in soil. And also uh, hydrochars have shown some high phytotoxicity because of the organics present uh, in there. So we have to solve these two problems before large scale applications happen. One such example of, uh, of hydrosar as a soil amendment is the conversion of chicken feather waste. So you can see how many different biomasses we can use, even chicken feathers via hydrothermal carbonization. Uh, when the others applied fresh hydrochar to the soil at a very low rate, even 1.5% in soil, uh, there was considerable phytotoxicity. But after washing the hydrochar with water, most of the organics were removed, normal water, I mean, 
because of uh, they were polar molecules, so they were removed and phytotoxicity was, ma was much reduced. But now you will ask, how can we wash large quantities of hydrochar? If we have, for example, one ton or two tons or 10 tons of hydrochar to apply in soil, is it, is it feasible to, to wash such quantities? No, it's not feasible. And it depends on some parameters that we will discuss next. This is the graph showing that uh, washed, washed uh, hydrochars uh, have a much, much better germination indexes, which means less phytotoxicity compared to unwashed hydrochars. Almost washed hydrochars achieved germination indices almost same as the control. But uh, we have to remember that hydrochars are used in very small percentages in soil. We're not talking large applications. We're talking applications of one or two or 3% in soil. <clears throat> Another study is, to, is the hydrothermal carbonization of microalgae for phosphorus recycling. Uh, this is a typical of uh, circular bioeconomy. Uh, the others here converted algae to hydrochar at 260 degrees Celsius. Uh, most of phosphorus that was present in the original biomass in the algae was retained in the final product. Uh, so this hydrochar showed a good fertilization potential for wheat. So they tested this hydrochar in wheat and uh, they, they so that uh, the yield was uh, increased more than a conventional chemical fertilizer when this was used. So this is a very promising result. These others did not uh, detect any phytotoxicity. So this is good. Again, this is the circular bioeconomy concept the others followed in a diagram. Now, uh, coming more to, uh, to our own applications of my group, uh, this, is, this is the first um, uh, publication I would like to present that we did last year, is the production of hydrochars from miscanthus. Uh, one small word about miscanthus. Uh, this is a biomass typically used uh, to produce biofuels in the Balkans and in some other countries. But uh, during the processing of miscanthus, uh, there is a lot of waste. There are a lot of agricultural residues, miscanthus residues, that they have no value for the biofuel industry. So we took these residues and we produced hydrochar and we developed a very good adsorbent for copper and ammonium ions. Uh, we produced these uh, uh, hydrochars in this temperature rate, range between 180 and 260 degrees Celsius for a short time, only one hour. Uh, we tried to keep the processing as simple as possible, so we did not modify the hydrochar in any way after we prepared them, uh, because we wanted to avoid increasing the experimental complexity, so we used them as is. And the optimum uh, hydrochar was the one prepared at the lower temperature, as we will see in this temperature, uh, in this table, uh, the maximum capacity for uh, ammonium and uh, copper ions was achieved with the hydrochar samples, a sample prepared at the lower temperature. As we determined, the reason for this was because this sample had uh, the higher number of uh, hydroxyl functional groups and other functional groups which interacted better with ammonium and uh, copper. Uh, that's why they managed to absorb higher quantities uh, of these ions. The other samples, uh, most of the functional groups on the surface had uh, been eliminated. So their interaction with the cations was very poor. I have to say that hydrochars have no porosity. Generally, I have to add this. So uh, in many cases where uh, um, hydrochars are used as adsorbents, we don't have physical adsorption, 
because the porosity is, cannot be developed during hydrothermal carbonization. Porosity of most hydrochars is very, very low. In another study by a different group, uh, they developed uh, phosphorus enriched hydrochar for soil remediation. Uh, so they applied uh, their uh, phosphorus enriched hydrochar from bamboo. Uh, in a contaminated soil, in, in, a, in a lead contaminated soil at a rate of 5% in the soil. And they managed, the hydrochar managed to uh, immobilize lead in the first week and keep the soil levels, the lead, the, um, lead uh, levels in soil below two milligrams per liter. So it is a good medium this hydrochar is a good medium to mix it with soil, with contaminated soil, and immobilize uh, heavy metals. And there are many, many papers and many research groups working in this field in heavy metal immobilization uh, using uh, these materials. Now, in the final uh, application that we are also active in this, uh, last year we developed uh, a a copper hydrochar nanocomposite uh, for the sonocatalytic degradation of organic contaminants. We prepared hydrochars from wood, from wood sawdust. Uh, in this case, the sawdust was dry, so we had to add our own water. Uh, the duration of the processing was two hours, six and 12 hours. And then after we prepared the hydrochars, we deposited copper oxide uh, nanoparticles on the hydrochar surface, surface. And then we used this uh, catalyst uh, to degrade this uh, textile uh, compound, this uh, dye, acid blue 92, which is a typical example. We used it as a typical example of textile wastewater. And th this compound was degraded by 85% after 90 minutes at a neutral pH uh, using ultrasonic radiation okay, to activate and to produce uh, radicals. Uh, and uh, these radicals then react with acid blue and degrade it. So in this case, our nanocomposite acted as the catalyst in this process. This is just one graph uh, from the paper. Uh, the optimum, the optimum uh, catalyst was the one prepared with the sample with the hydrochar that was prepared after two hours only. The deposition of the copper uh, nanoparticle was better in this uh, sample. The dispersion of copper nanoparticles was better in this sample. This is why uh, the performance of the first sample was better. Now, in a slightly different study, I have not talked about biochar, and biochar is not the focus of today's uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, similarly to the uh, publication before, we produced a different nanocomposite, a different uh, nanocatalyst. Uh, we deposited uh, palladium uh, on biochar, on magnetic biochar, and we used it uh, as a catalyst to promote the Suzuki Miyaura reaction. Now, this reaction has nothing to do with degradation of pollutants, of contaminants. This is a reaction, is a carbon-carbon reaction, which you build higher carbon components from this reaction. And our uh, nanocomposite uh, was very successful in promoting this reaction. And we achieved high yields for these compounds called uh, biarils. Okay, so the focus of this work was not to show only that the catalyst is successful, but to show that we can prepare a catalyst based on a, based on a green process, on an environmentally friendly process, and achieve the same yields, the same success as other nanocatalysts used in this field. Uh, and this is this is this is a rationale behind our work is to is to to get to obtain important materials, but always having in mind that there is a waste management uh, um, basis on this, 
uh, that we utilize biomasses, we utilize waste, and we protect the environment. All materials have environmental aspects. So this is what we try to do, is promote the environmental aspects and the environmental fingerprint of materials. So about some, some research gaps. Uh, the hydrogen surface can be adjusted to be hydrophobic. So this is a quite a new area that uh, we are starting working right now. Uh, we are focusing on hydrophobic hydrochars, which means hydrochars that don't want to interact with water, but they prefer to interact with oily faces. And what we mean oily faces, contaminants such as engine oil, petroleum oil, and so on. The sea or from the soil, okay? Uh, there are, of course, problems as we discussed when it comes to scaling up. Scaling up is not easy because we have to take into consideration the logistics of the whole process, uh, biomass availability and storage. Uh, as you may know, there are several biomasses that cannot be preserved. And after one or two months or after a few weeks, they lose their properties, which is not good. We have to check the energy balances, the market values for the products and several other aspects. Uh, as part of a biorefinery, HTC may be one, one process of several. So how I see the future of this process is that it may not stand alone, but as part of a treatment train for a biomass, uh, I think it's a quite important process and it can go further. Clearly if it can compete with composting because composting until now it has been the established method for uh, wet biomasses. Uh, the problem with composting of course is that it can only produce one product, the compost, which is non, not very flexible and it only has one application. Uh, of course it is a much cheaper process. Uh, however, the products that we obtain from HTC are more refined, can be, can be tunable. We can, we can tune their properties and we usually target higher end applications. These are some final references, including our recent works. Uh, this uh, work uh, was performed uh, last year with uh, colleagues from the Department of Electronics Engineering and I'm quite happy about this. And some other works here, uh, also from uh, in cooperation with different groups uh, from Greece uh, and abroad. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, it was quite interesting. I tried to uh, start from the scratch of uh, the subcritical water and uh, go a long way to the recent applications. I think this is not easy in 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, there are also many different aspects of hydrothermal carbonization involved, but I try to focus maybe on the most important. Thank you very much, Dimitris, for this lively and very informative presentation. Actually, you know, me as a non-expert, it helped me a lot that you started, you know, from the very beginning of, of some, some fundamentals in order to follow the chain of the whole process. Um, please stop sharing the screen and in order to check if there are some questions, I personally I have some questions, uh, but I will give the floor first to the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? So if this is the case, let me start with my questions. Um, I have several questions, for example, I like very much the idea, I will start from the beginning. I like very much the idea about of this is the first time that I, I have heard about this terminology subcritical uh, water. I, I like, I was very much impressed and this is something new regarding the change of the dielectric constant that you are elevating the temperature of the water. So I would like to ask you, this means that also the optical properties are changing. So the refractive index is changing. Yes. Yes, yes, but this is this is not something that we have uh, focused on no, no, this is in terms us. of chemical applications, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, this is fine, just to reconfirm. 
Another question that I have, and also I was very much impressed, based fundamentally as in the graphene or in the graphene oxide, we're using graphene oxide, you know, because it has an attraction that we can solve it um, in water. And th this is quite um, obvious for us, it's a polar, and it's a polar, so we can solve, you know, the graphene oxide. Uh, but regarding now the non-polar, you mentioned something that the subcritical is a solvent of a non-polar molecule. So I would mm -hmm. like to elevate it, to elaborate a little bit, you know, how does it work? And I, the second question on, or regarding this aspect is the following. I mean, if we use, can we use the subcritical water as a solvent in general of polar and non-polar molecules? So the first question is like, how, how do we solve uh, non-polar molecules using the subcritical water? What is the mechanism? And second, if we can use um, the subcritical uh, water as a solvent of everything. Well, let's start from the mechanism, uh, which is not always easy because we're talking about chemical interactions uh, between water uh, and other molecules. Uh, these, multi, these, these molecular interactions are, uh, have, there are all sorts of different interactions between this, these molecules. Um, polarity is one, uh, I mean, the similarity in polarity is one mechanism that may solubilize molecules in subcritical, in good water or subcritical water. Is a very important mechanism, polarity. So if you have, if the polarity of water matches the polarity of the molecule you are interested in, then you may expect, may expect, that this molecule will be soluble in water. Okay, this is a general, of course there are exceptions. The good thing about water is that we can tune its properties. If we elevate the temperature, we can tune its properties to solubilize the molecules we are interested in. If we keep water at low temperatures, then water is polar. So we focus on polar substances. But then the interaction with non-polar is, is very, very low. So water will ignore non-polar substances. If we raise the temperature, of course, in a closed reactor, water becomes essentially non-polar and it will attract, it will attract, maybe this is a good word to use, non-polar substances. But if at the same time we reduce the temperature, then water will throw away the non-polar substances. So if you want to keep the non-polar compounds soluble, you have to keep the temperature high. And also in the closed system to have this confinement. Always, always in a closed system, always in a closed system, either dynamic with a flow or static mode, no flow. So everything is closed. Mm -hmm. so, so in this sense, if we want to dissolve a solid material in water, graphene, I think it's uh, non-polar or? It's non-polar, the graphene is non-polar. It's non-polar. So if you try to solubilize it in normal water, it will not happen. Yeah, but if we are going to it try will... to a closed system of water elevated and the temperature of, what was the temperature, like something 200? 200. Yeah. And then see what happens. Yes, we can try and see what happens in the structure of graphene. Yeah, or on the solubility of the graphene, because you are going to have it, you know, in powder. Oh, yes, 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 yes. All right. The solubility of and is there any such a facility in Crete, in your lab? And not in my lab. We, I, for, this, for this specific experiment that we are descri describing now, we can do it in Turkey. In Turkey. Okay, no problem. With, with colleagues, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I still have some questions. Um, for example, I like very much uh, you, you decorate the surface. Now I, can, oh, of course, uh, 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 I would like to mention that now I can understand why the hydrocharge or the biocharge, they did not work as a sensors because they, they have no, uh, no porosity. And porosity for the gas sensing is, is very important. Uh, but I, let me go back. You mentioned nanoparticles. You decorate 
um, the platform of your hydrotar, you know, with nanoparticles, if I remember well. So my, my I have two questions. Like, first of all, is like, why nanoparticles? Why did you use nanoparticles? Probably, probably you said that, but you know, I did not get it. So why did you decorate with nanoparticles? What was the, the role of the nanoparticles in the whole process? For example, you mentioned something about catalysis it was the process. Yes. And the second question is like, do you use chemical routing in order to decorate the nanoparticles into the, into the surface? Surface. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we, use, we use conventional methodology typically used to prepare catalysts uh, other catalysts, for example, palladium decorated catalysts or um, iron oxide decorated catalysts. Uh, the only difference was that we, instead of using a conventional substrate, and co a conventional surface for this, we changed this and we tested our hydrochars. Will they be good substrates? So the methodology was typical chemical um, deposition. We just deposited. There was deposition only okay. of the particles on the surface. Mm -hmm. So Dimitris, in order to understand, so this, this biochar was the template where the nanoparticles yes. will be placed. Yes. So the yes, yes, whole yes. the catalysis happened by the nanoparticles. Yes. OK. This yes, is yes, clear. exactly, yes. exactly, I, yes. I the, 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 the substrate, the template played no role in catalysis itself. Yeah. It's the nanoparticles that played the role. Yeah. And I would like to ask, how long, how long did it take from the chemical reaction or from the methodology that you used in order to achieve this decoration? I think it's a quite, uh, it's quite a speedy process. It's a matter of a few hours for the decoration, yeah. for, for the deposition. For you, it's like a short. For us, in optics, it's very long. So probably, in optics, I, yes. I will suggest you to organize an experiment to bring me, you know, this kind of uh, templates and also using lasers in order to see, to check how much we reduce the, the total reaction because we have done the same experiments in order to decorate graphene oxide templates using chemical routes and also optical routes. And in optics, it happens in seconds, not in oh. hours. So probably yes, I, I a lot of energy and it's going to be more efficient. I think that please keep it into your mind to prepare me some such a template and I'm going, I will organize, you know, this experiment with lasers. It's going to be very fast. If it yes, works. I think this is quite, it's always, uh, it's always interesting to develop um, different, uh, you know, to combine different sciences in this kind of materials and uh, we I, can I develop know. new applications. Yeah, exactly. And uh, also, I don't know if, you know, the, I have still questions. Like, for example, you mentioned something, the humidity. You say that you are producing something dry by your charts. And then in order, you know, to place, to make applications, you need to add some humidity in order the whole process to happen. Uh, wh uh, so why humidity? Why you would like to add? No, it's, I mean, hydrothermal carbonization mm -hmm. is based on the interaction of water with something else with biomass. If the biomass is completely dry, for example, if I dry it before in the oven, then I need a, a source of water. So you are providing to your biochar a polarity through the water to interact with the other water. Wait, 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 wait. And now it's a bit mixed up. Uh, water has to be in the system, has to be in the system, in the reactor. So now there are two ways to put water in the system, either the natural water of the agricultural residue, okay? So for example, a fruit peel, a fruit peel, an apple peel has its own water. So I don't add water, I just use the natural water of the fruit. So all change is happening there. But if I want to use a dry biomass for one reason or another, I want to make an experiment with a dry biomass. Uh, for example, a dry wood, olive tree, olive tree prunings, for example. Then I cannot rely my experiment on the very, very small percentage of water inside the tree. I have to add my own water in the reactor. So the, this is a technical aspect. Anyhow. And of course, the, the percentage of the, the amount of water you add with the biomass is not a very crucial role. I did, I did not discuss about this. We did not talk about this. 
but uh, for example, you may add a little bit more water or less water, the process will not be affected, of, uh, provided you have enough water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a minimum, there is a minimum. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something else about HTC method, which is the hydrothermal carbonization, if I remember well, you, you mentioned some parameters like the pressure or um, the temperature, you know, how, how the effect is impacted by the elevation of the temperature. I would like to ask you something. What about the rate that you are providing this thermal energy? It's not only the temperature, but how fast you will regulate your system to go from 100 to 180. So this rate, how much impacts the process? It has a very small impact because okay. hydrothermal carbonization reactions are slow and usually the process takes at least two hours, two hours until six hours. So the times are long enough uh, and they are not really affected by heating the reactor very, very quickly or more slowly. So, so the heating time, and this is proven, it's not, it's not a major part of the process. And also we have to take, uh, to take into consideration the heating capacity of the stainless steel cell. Uh, the stainless steel has a specific heat uh, capacity. So if I want to heat the stainless steel very quickly, I need very specialized equipment. If I, usually, to give you an example, for the stainless steel to reach 200 degrees Celsius, it takes about 30, 35 minutes, okay? If my experiment is a four hour experiment, I accept this 30 minutes as an experimental error. I cannot do anything about this because uh, the, the, it's impossible to heat the reactor in two minutes or four minutes or five minutes. It's, it's impossible. So we need, we, we usually take as time zero, the time we put the reactor inside the oven. But practically you are right that the reactor reaches our temperature, the desired temperature, after half an hour or 40 minutes. So our four, four hour experiment is, is, is in reality not four hour experiment, is for example, three and a half hours. But because it is generally accepted that we take as time zero, the time we put the oven, uh, the reactor inside the preheated oven. The oven is always preheated, okay? So stainless steel takes a bit of time to get heat, to heat up. Okay, we, we, we should accept this as, as an experimental error and it's always the same in all experiments, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But also this is a source of spending energy. Eh? This makes, you know, the whole process oh, yes. less, you know, less efficient. I know I was thinking that in, in the graphene technology we have observed that the reduction also has been impacted uh, by the rate that we're going to deliver during the, 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 the reduction of the graphene oxide, uh, the rate that we are providing. So it's a different effect if we are going to send, for example, uh, using nanosecond and femtosecond laser pulses. The, the, the process is different regarding the time, you know, regarding the, uh, how short or how long the whole process will be improved. Uh, or, yes, because, because in your case, your processes are, are fast, generally are very fast. Uh, I mean, the laser-like uh, technologies, but in, in, in my technology, the conversion of biomass is slow. So uh, this experimental error is acceptable. In, in, if, my, if my reactions were like half an hour uh, long, then losing half an hour to hit it, it would be totally unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is from my side. Thank you very much, Dimitris, for the, the, the questions, the presentation from my side, I'm fully covered. Uh, I don't know if anyone from the audience has any questions. Okay. So if this is the case, I would like to thank once again, uh, Dimitris for this very nice presentation. Always it's nice to hear from other colleagues what they are doing and they communicate each other. I think that this is something that should happen every day, every, every hour, I don't know. Uh, so thank you, Kostas. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. No, no, I mean, it's an honor for us and hopefully more colleagues from HMU, from our department, from all the departments, from all, all, all other universities.
We try through the Sai Cafe to bring also other Greek scientists, not only from abroad, but from the whole, the ecosystem. So as a Sai Cafe organizer, you know, I'm, I really appreciate if you have other colleagues to suggest us from abroad or from Greece in order to invite them. Okay, so I would like to thank all of you for your, for your attention, your patience, and uh, see you next Friday with Professor Lanzani, the director of Italian Institute of Technology. So I will feed the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.